Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, what's it like for people living in northern Israel with Hezbollah and other terror groups just across the border in Lebanon? Plus, a unique training center in biblical Samaria where Jews and Christians work together to raise up leaders in the next generation with strength and heart. And memorable moments from Pat Robertson's years hosting the 700 Club. All this and more on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl. The U.S. and Iran are quietly negotiating an informal deal to limit Tehran's nuclear program and avoid a military confrontation. Under the new pact, which Israeli officials call imminent, Iran would not enrich uranium to the level needed for a nuclear bomb. Iran would also stop attacks on American contractors in the region, increase cooperation with nuclear inspectors, and free American prisoners. In return, the U.S. would avoid tightening sanctions on Iran and unfreeze billions in Iranian assets for humanitarian purposes. The New York Times report came after Iran said the West cannot stop it from building a nuclear weapon if it wanted one. Meanwhile, Israel is prepared to confront Iran directly if needed. No agreement with Iran would bind Israel. With or without an agreement, we will continue to do everything necessary to protect the state of Israel. Northern Israel and the Galilee are beautiful, but there's a drawback to living there. Iranian-backed Hezbollah and other terror groups are entrenched just across the border in Lebanon. I recently went there to see the threat Israelis face. On Passover this year, Hamas launched 36 rockets toward northern Israeli communities. While the Iron Dome defense system intercepted 25, one landed here. It was just an empty warehouse, nothing happened, but you can see that across the street, it's a kindergarten and it's a home over here. I think this explains us in the best way, the contradiction between the beautiful day, normal life, happy children, and what could have happened if, if it was not a holiday. Sarit Zahavi lives near the border and began the Alma Research Center, an organization focused on security challenges in the region. I believe that uh, Hezbollah assisted, that Hezbollah helped Hamas to find the locations, to find where exactly to launch from. Iran backs Hezbollah, a powerful longtime enemy in Lebanon. The terror group has tens of thousands of rockets aimed across the border in order to carry out the regime's main goals, including wiping Israel off the map. This is the Israel-Lebanon border. The tower behind me belongs to Hezbollah, and they're also building the road, which shows you just how close the threat is. Zahavi recently captured these photos of Hezbollah surveilling the area even closer to the border. Some 268,000 Israelis live within 12 miles of the 49-mile-long Israel-Lebanon border. About 250 of them are in Zarit, a community founded in 1967 that lies about 650 feet from Hezbollah lookouts. In general, it's good for us. Quiet, relaxed, good atmosphere. Everything is green. Everything is beautiful. Born and raised here, 54-year-old Yossi Baroness heads up security and says his biggest worry is the thought of Hezbollah potentially reaching into the community. If Hezbollah would infiltrate, then I would have to deal with it. Against this, we're on high alert all the time. I really was born here. I feel that this is my only home. Uh, first of all, it's uh, Zionism, because if we won't be here, there will be no other, another people which will come and settle here. This is the most beautiful place in the earth. The political issues and the security issues are very disturbing, but we're trying to live our lives good and safe. 52-year-old Renat Carmel says Hezbollah's advanced weaponry frightens her the most. But by bombing us with new rockets and things we cannot avoid or get sheltered from them or be safe. Uh, I think the next war will be more sophisticated and we don't know enough. We know a lot about their programs, about this settlement. They want to occupy us and then to kill uh, people or to take some refugees and then to negotiate. Part of the border is walled and the IDF is building more each day. The decision to build the wall was taken a few years ago, but in the past year, the project was accelerated. Several years ago, the IDF uncovered a massive Hezbollah terror tunnel at Zarit, intended to bring death and destruction to the people along the border. 
and recently at the edge of Zarit by the community's mushroom factory, Hezbollah carried out a drill just meters away simulating an attack including kidnapping Israelis. When these black towers first appeared, the IDF published that these black towers belonged to the Lebanese army. But actually, every day, maybe now, including yesterday, we see Hezbollah military operatives on top of these black towers. All of this happens under the watchful eye of the United Nations, which creates another dilemma for Israel. It's the same dilemma with the human shield issue. What do you do if there is a launcher next to this UN position over there, and it is launching to Yossi's house in Zarit, and if you destroy the launcher, you may destroy the UN position as well. If you don't destroy the launcher, it's Yossi's family. Even though Hezbollah and Iran are not interested in a Palestinian state like others, a nearby water tower is meant to look like the Dome of the Rock on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. There is a reason why it's decorated like the Dome of the Rock. This is exactly building the narrative that where we are standing, in their point of view, this is Palestine. In their point of view, the whole area from the Galilee to Elat, from the river to the sea, it's Palestine. So for now, Israelis living on the border continue their daily lives under this growing threat from Iran and Hezbollah, knowing at any moment they could be attacked by a brutal enemy that desires their destruction. Coming up, a leadership center where biblical heroes provide the basis for training the next generation in mind and body. In 2010, CBN News began to cover a story set in the hills of ancient Samaria, part of Israel's biblical heartland. It began a partnership between Jews and Christians building a one-of-a-kind training center. As Chris Mitchell reports, it just passed an historic milestone. This is the city of Ariel, considered the capital of Samaria, established in 1978. It's just a remarkable, a sign and wonder that if you can imagine that this city was anticipated by God and that here, some 40 years later, you've got the regional hub of all of Samaria. And important to Samaria, the crown jewel, is this national center for leadership development. Heather Johnston is co-founder of JH Israel, an organization committed to inspire the next generation of Israeli leaders to live their lives with purpose and a biblical identity. One of the main ways they do that is through the National Leadership Center, or NLC, where now more than 100,000 Israelis have come through. So we are believing that God creating him in his image as a people. So the gate of the NLC is open for everybody. We have soldiers that coming from the IDF. Most of the participants are students that coming from all over. We have Arabs, Israelis that coming, a lot of groups of them, Jewish and Arabs coming together. Even we have groups of Palestinians. This garden is open for everybody. JH Israel is based on learning through experience. Behind me is an obstacle course called the Odyssey, where people have to work together to accomplish a common goal. People from various walks of life go through obstacles together that are challenging, fun, and a gateway to the heart. And we see the heart of the parents are very open to the children and children as well. To them. Because we are doing fun first, they are coming to here, they are climbing, they are doing, and then we start speaking with them about big issues in the family, in the government, in the country. Endorsed by Israel's education ministry, the program focuses on biblical characters to help teach lessons. So a reflection on the life of Joshua and Caleb and King David and how they connected with God personally, how they saw themselves in relation to Israeli society and then how to relate to the other. First thing uh, we are speaking about the life of King David. Every child, we are say to them that we believe that you can be the next King David. We speak with them about Abram, we are speaking about Moses, we are speaking with them about going by a, a miracle from Egypt. So this is what we are speaking with the young people, coming back to the roots, understand the roots, understand our purpose. A human question that is everybody is open for that. Johnston sees it as a fulfillment of prophecy. 
I believe that we are standing in the days of Ezekiel 36. And if you can imagine that God anticipated the unfolding of modern Israel, the return of the Jews from the four quarters of the earth that would uh, come after that, where God said, I'm going to take out the heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, O Israel. I'm going to put my spirit in you. And I'm going to lead you into a place of submission to me. Johnston believes the center is helping influence the nation. And I think that's the cultural shift inside of Israel today, which is toward the biblical heritage, toward a biblical identity, a biblical worldview. And that's what's happening, I believe, in this nation from the top to the bottom. Johnston describes it as a remarkable partnership between Christians and Jews. God anticipated that the Gentiles would come here, as we see in Jeremiah 31, in those days and at that time when you're rebuilding the cities, they come in from the land of the north. Again, you'll plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit, and there'll be a day when the watchmen, that is the Gentile believers, will stand here on these hills and say, come let us go up to the Lord our God. After passing one milestone, they would like to welcome the next 100,000 and beyond. And I think it's the future is going to be amazing because the heart of the people is changing. We see the heart of stone changing. And this is the, the greatest of the nation, to connect it to the roots and the future is going to be amazing. This is what we are doing here. We are teaching them about the past that we can build a better future for all the children in Israel. And this is our wish. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, JH Israel, Ariel. Up next, spreading the gospel throughout the world, the ambitious plan to complete the Great Commission by 2033. The last command of Jesus to his disciples was to take the gospel to the whole world. Some believe the completion of that Great Commission can be finished in our generation. Chris Mitchell has more. Our big vision, which is that every person on earth would have an authentic encounter with Jesus Christ through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit by Pentecost 2033. Dr. Billy Wilson, president of Oral Roberts University, is leading the worldwide effort Empowered 21, which began in 2013. What we're finding is a growing number of movements, denominations, and networks who are making commitments toward 2033 to bring the gospel to every person on earth. This is a very unusual time, Chris, maybe unlike any time in Christian history where a un unified commitment is going on across the kingdom of God to bring the gospel where it has never been brought before in our generation. Wilson cites a recent event of global leaders in New York City. We uh, did a commitment called the 2033 Commitment, where all of us committed that this would be the most significant decade of Great Commission effort in the history of the church. And together, I believe we can make that happen. Later this month, a gathering in Amsterdam will serve as the starting gun as this evangelistic effort takes off with 160 leaders from more than 120 nations. But I believe Amsterdam has the potential to be the most significant Christian gathering of our lifetime. I, I know that sounds amazing, but I really believe it because we're focusing on the right thing together across the body of Christ. While reaching the world with the gospel appears a daunting task, Wilson says it simply begins with one person. So I can't reach everyone by myself, but I can reach one. And in that conversion, in that one person knowing Jesus, the potential of multitudes, the woman of Samaria was just one person. But in her conversion was a whole group of people that would come to Jesus. The demoniac of Gadara and Decapolis was just one person. But when he got saved, a whole region opened up to the ministry of Jesus. The theme of Amsterdam is everyone, but with a focus on reaching every single person. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Still ahead, a few memorable moments from Pat Robertson's 45 years hosting the 700 Club. In the wake of CBN founder Pat Robertson's death, we want to take a moment to look back at his run hosting the 700 Club. The clips show the range of his interests and give you a glimpse of his humanity. Enjoy. We're here by the Golden Gate of Jerusalem, 
Some call it the Eastern Gate. This is the place where Jesus Christ came and entered the city of Jerusalem. He came down from the Mount of Olives and came up the winding pathway and rode into the city. And they said, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Frank, it was a pleasure to have you back with us on the 700 Club. Were you, were you surprised when you prayed essentially in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the inauguration? Well, you know, Pat, we, we, I knew there would probably be some discussion about that. But I've been to two Republican conventions that prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they certainly knew who they were inviting. I, I'm a minister of the gospel. I have, there's no other name that I can approach the throne of God uh, except through the, the name of Christ. Would you please welcome to the 700 Club from Malibu, California, the very lovely Jennifer O'Neill. <laughs> hey, <laughs> welcome. It's so good to see you. Nice to see you. Started at 15. What's the secret? You look as lovely as ever. How, how, <laughs> how does it work? What do you do? Um, well, I, I uh, exercise a lot as well and use cover girl, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and I have someone looking over me. Yeah, obviously. you sure do. Well, I have one of the great pitchers of all time. Oral Hershey's is with me, and he's going to give us some pitching lessons, and maybe I will show him how he can enhance himself with the uh, AIDS-defying <laughs> shake. Oh, my oh. gosh. Well, what do you do? Uh, I'm going to throw a ball. Yeah? And I guess we're going to see what the radar gun says. Okay, well, there's a guy over there. He's a long way away. Is that how far away it is? Okay. Yeah, it's pretty Looks, far. It's a long way. All right. Here we go. Okay. Let me throw one. Go ahead. Go at it. All right, what? Ho! Oh. You got a radar gun? How much? Uh, 75. Oh, 75. Now! You gonna throw one? I guess, but I got my ball for you. <laughs> you gonna get a ball for me? Yeah. What do you do? You just hold on here, huh? Well, you got it. Yeah. Have you pitched before? Well, yes, but not like you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you, you, you get yourself ready like this, and then you let it go, huh? Oh! That, oh, that was a lot harder than mine. Somehow we got 99 on that what one, What the Pat. hell is it here? <laughs> You're seeing more people come to the Lord now than ever in your life, and so are we. Yes, yes, we are seeing them come to the Lord, and, and the challenge is having seen them come to the Lord, watching them become discipled, where they can develop as Christians, I think mm -hmm. it's gonna be so important, and we really need to pray uh, for those that are teaching and leading God's men and women that we are discipled so that we can go out and get the harvest, yeah. the latter-day harvest. Sean, it's great to have you with us hey, on the hey, 700. Pat, Club. it's a little bit of role reversal. I you're, know. Because yeah, <laughs> you're a regular guest, and, and by the way, I, I think some of the finest moments we've ever had on TV are when you and Alan are battling out some of the, the great moral issues of the day, and you always do a great job. Thank you so much for having me. That's Aww. You get all what a beautiful. Okay, that's enough. So would you please welcome Amy Grant as she sings El Shaddai. El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Thank you. So glad you were here. Long time no see. It has been a long time. I remember when you did your first crossover album, you came up and said, what do you think? And I mean, it was great. You know, God has blessed you so much. We're yes. so proud really to see you. They called me and they said, we'd like you to perform in front of President Reagan's cabinet. Uh -huh. and, and I said, I always wanted to see Nancy's China. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I have been very fortunate to meet the president several times, uh, Re President Reagan, and then when I was performing for President Bush, uh, they, I remember they called and they um, said, we'd like to go to the White House and perform uh, in, fr uh, in front of the Bushes. Now, my... <laughs> Would you please welcome to the 700 Club, Mr. Robert Duvall. Good to have you with us. Hey, man. We got some fans here. I don't know. <laughs> the, the, the Duval Fan Club came with you. Before we talk about the movie, we're hearing 
in Virginia, and I want to clarify one thing. I saw one uh, article that said you had a farm of 200 acres, another that said you had a farm in Virginia of 350, and I want to know which is it. Is it 350 or 200? 300, 360. <laughs> so neither one of them are right. right. Hey, how was your Hello flight? There. How was your flight in? Oh, terrific! Uh, yes, we. Uh, uh, my wife gets these economy tickets on the oh. uh, computer, so uh, I uh, I flew from Los Angeles to New York for eight dollars. And uh, <laughs> let me tell you, you don't get much service at eight dollars. <laughs> it's crazy, you know. But uh, yeah, and the crew gets on board, and they uh, tell you what a wonderful flight it's going to be. Mm -hmm. as you saw there. Then they uh, spend about 15 minutes telling you how you can get killed on the same flight, which kind of relaxes everybody, you know? Yeah. I go a long way back with you. You sure do. <laughs> you were back in the old building in Portsmouth yes, when we were back. Yes, I call Most that Tortilla Flat. <laughs> <laughs> Bad and worse. <laughs> but I, I thought, you know, when I had dinner with you, yes. I, we had just come from Dusty's wedding. Mm -hmm. And when we had you and Dodie and I, my little girl, yeah, yeah. and you said, I'm going to have, the Lord's told me I'm going to have a Christian network with lots of stations. And then I went out there with you, you know, to do that program. And I said to myself, this man is either the greatest visionary I've ever met or he's a crank. <laughs> Well, there's still people in society who aren't quite sure. So. Well, Pat, personally, Ben and I are both are right? visionary. Absolutely. But <laughs> Happy Christmas. That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.